Good afternoon, everybody. Now we have the traditional welcome with Chandan and Kuri. A very hearty welcome to the 17th lecture of Vishwabharati Lecture Series on Sino-India Relationship to be delivered by His Excellency Ambassador Shun Wei Dong, Chinese Ambassador to India. We are extremely grateful to His Excellency Ambassador Sun Wen Wei Rung, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing correctly, but please excuse me, Chinese Ambassador to India who has joined as ambassador to India very recently and visiting Shantini Ketan almost immediately after his joining for having agreed to deliver lecture at a very short notice and to address our students, faculty and other employees on an important topic that is of, of, of utmost concern for each one of us today. We are delighted and proud to have him with us for the Vishwabharati Lecture Series. I will not take much time to speak in detail about the lecture series today as we have very limited time, but I will only remind the prime objective of starting the lecture series that is to have a platform for dialogue with distinguished scholars, researchers and the best minds of the country and abroad in any field to have a platform where we can have free exchange of ideas and where we can question each other with respect and enter into dialogue to understand each other's views, a step in tune with the true spirit of Vishwabharati that was emphasized by our founder, Rabindranath Tagore. Today, we have gathered to have exchanges on issues relating to Sino-India relationship that is one of, our, one of the most significant theme across the globe and more so for India as we need to improve our relationship simply because we are the greatest democracies of the world and also ancient cultures cultural, political, social, academic, and moral. It is here in Shantini Kitan, we gave a lead to the China-India relationship in early 90s, and China 
the Chinna Bhavan, the first center of the country for Chinese language and culture was established. It is with this legacy of academic exchanges and ideas that we can still claim to have a better understanding and cooperation between the two countries. Unfortunately, all of us have our opinion about the issues based on partial information through media leading to some understanding and some misunderstandings. Therefore, as a leading academic institution, it is an imperative for us to address the discussions today. Today, we are fortunate to listen to Ambassador Sun Vi Dong, Chinese Ambassador to India. I extend a very hearty welcome to once again to all of you and request Professor Vidhu Chakravarti, Vice Chancellor, to kindly preside over the lecture. Professor Chakravarti, please. Thank you. Namaskar, Ada, Satsyaka, and good afternoon. Mr. Ambassador Sun, Madam Sun, Mr. Tawdi, my brother, and Madam, and all of us who are here. I think I first begin by thanking all of you. Because this particular lecture was decided all of a sudden. I got the news from the CG at about 10 o'clock and then I wanted Mr. Sud, the ambassador, to address us on this particular issue, signing the relations. It's a rare opportunity to have ambassador in our midst. And then we started organizing. I am really, really impressed, like the ambassador, for your spontaneous gathering. So first, thank goes to you. And obviously, I thank Mr. Ambassador, his excellent companion, Mr. Dhaudi, and excellent companion. I think, you know, we have got natural right over China. And there is a historical perspective. There is a historical perspective. It started with Tagore's first visit to Shantaniketa in 1924. He visited Beijing and Shanghai and some other places. Then, 1928, one professor from China, Professor Tan Sud, came to India, and we had the Jina Bhavan in 1937. And then, in 1957, as you know, the Premier Choi Lai came to Jina Bhavan, and I think we have the owner of a rare autograph of the Premier Choi Lai, because the ambassador told me that he would like to keep it as a memento, because that particular autograph is rarely available. So we have the, the, kind of, the owner of that precious document. Then, 2014, the Chinese president awarded five principles of peaceful coexistence to China government. That's also an interesting achievement as far as we are concerned. And then now today, 2020, His Excellency the Ambassador, Mr. Sun, is with us. So there is a historical legacy. So I think with Sun's visit, that legacy is revived. And before that, I must thank the CG of Calcutta, our friend, my brother, and the pollution of Vishwavarati, Mr. Chao Lee. Because, as you know, he's a very familiar face. We don't consider him to be CG. We consider him to be part of our family. And he has happily accepted it. And I think, Mr. Ambassador, after this visit to Shantini Ketan, you will also feel like being partner of this huge university called Vishwavarati. And I'm telling you on behalf of all of us that we will accept you happily as member of the Paribar of the family, right? So we'll have one more family, Madam uh, Sue and Mr. Sue, right? And you know, I, I don't want to stand between him and his speech, but I finish by saying that we are honored by your visit. We are privileged by your visit. And you know, there is a plan for him to stay overnight. But somehow or the other, because of contingent circumstances, he has to travel back to Delhi tonight. 
So I told him that this visit is half done. So to complete the visit, you have to come back. And I think it's an assurance, right? Mr. Ambassador, it's an assurance. So it's an assurance. And you gave the assurance in front of all of us. <laughs> so, so I think we'll have him back soon. We'll have him back very soon. And we'll have an extended discussion later. Because today the time is very short. But still, he's kind, he's kind enough to address us. And now I'll request uh, Abhijit to introduce the speaker. What is Abhijit? Come. Good afternoon, everyone. Sun Wei Dong, Nian, Jiangsu Xu Ren. 1989年,96年,中华人民共和国外交学院教室。九六到九七,外交部,亚洲司,二名,九七到二零零年,驻马来西亚大使馆,二名。一名,二零零零年,到二零零五年,外交部,亚洲司,一名,副处长,处长。零
1952. So this shows that no matter where and where and when we are, the yearning and pursuit of peace for mankind are common and eternal. But however, history tells us that peace is not a low-hanging fruit. In today's world, unilateralism, hegemonism, and power politics still haunt us, and some countries still use force willingly in international relations, and even take military risks regardless of norms governing international relations. So we are facing lots of questions and challenges. Cooperation or confrontation, multilateralism, or unilateralism, justice, or the law of the jungle. Once again, the mankind are standing at a crossroads, and we are facing historical choice to where we are going to go. But the Chinese people have given our own answer to the question. We will always stick to the path of peaceful development and building a community of shared future for mankind and achieve win-win sharing. Today comes from yesterday and for any country, especially for countries with a long history like China and India, we would like to say that uh, we should know first where did we come from. Then we can know where we are going. So I would like to take this opportunity to talk to you about what kind of China is. First, same as, China, same as India, China has a time-honored civilization. The Chinese civilization has spanned over 5,000 years. And great thinkers such as Lao Tzu and Confucius, living in about 2,000 years ago, explored a wide range of topics for man's <coughs> relations with nature to relations among human beings and to, between, to the relations between individuals and society. And they underpin 
the unique system of Chinese philosophy, such as the emphasis on the kindness towards fellow human beings and the brief belief that man should be in harmony with each other and seeking harmony without uniform uniformity. These values and teachings still carries a profound impact on Chinese people's way of thinking and values. So the DNA of peace is deeply rooted in the blood of the Chinese people. When we are talking about the symbol of China, you can think about the Great War. But the Great War is for defensive, not for invasion. So that is a good example of the philosophy of Chinese history. The second reason, same as India, China has gone through many vicissitudes or disasters. As a result of foreign invasions in the recent, in the past centuries, China experienced great social turmoil and its people has to lead a life of extreme destitution. After hundreds of years of persistent and unyielding struggle and sacrificing tens of millions of lives, the Chinese people ultimately took their destiny back into their own hands since 1949. But nevertheless, the memory of foreign invasion and bullying has never been erased from our minds. And that explains why we cherish so dearly peace today. Confucius once said, do not impose on others what yourself do not desire. We would never impose the pain we have suffered by other countries. And this is the reason why China follows an independent foreign policy of peace. China is committed to non-interference into other countries' internal affairs, and China will not allow others to interfere into our own affairs. And the third reason is that, as India, China is also a country with a pressing need for development. Development is the top priority for China. And it also applies to all the countries in this world. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China 70 years ago, China now has become the second largest economy in the world. But as a country with a population of over 1.3 billion people, we are still keenly aware that China is the largest developing country in the world. Divided by its huge population, China's per capita GDP is still around 70th place in the world. And more than 15 million people need to get employment in China every year. So it's a huge task for the Chinese government to ensure a better livelihood for every Chinese citizen. And China must concentrate on development, which requires us to have a peaceful external environment. And the fourth reason is that, as India and many other countries, China is also a country committed to world peace and development. 
as Mr. Chakrabarti has mentioned, that China and India has jointly put forward and advocated the five principles of peaceful coexistence in the 1950s. And this is a vivid reflection of the wisdom of China and India working together to contribute to the world peace. As a major country, China has the responsibility to promote world peace. Starting in 2019, China now has become the second largest contributor to the United Nations regular budget, rising from 7.9% to 12% nowadays. China is also the largest, the second largest contributor to the United Nations peacekeeping operations. And we are also the largest contributor of military personnel among the five permanent members of the Security Council. Over the past 70 years, China has provided over 400 billion RMB yuan in foreign aid. Since the international financial crisis in 2008, China's contribution to the world economic growth has averaged over 30% annually. As the saying goes, in success, one should try to let others benefit. So we should not only be good to ourselves, but also to others. So dear teachers and students, China is an opportunity for the world development. But unfortunately, there are always some people who has a Cold War mentality. They choose to believe that when a country becomes strong, then it will seek to expand and dominate. These people, when they are living in the 21st century, their mindset remain in the Cold War era. In the 21st century, when human beings share a common destiny and the civilization is highly developed, isn't it against the history trend if someone look at international relations through the prism of the law of jungle. And this kind of wrong ideas at the end of the day is due to the obsession with hegemonic opposition and also the Cold War mentality. Of course China will become even stronger and this is something that is bound to happen. But it is not necessary that a stronger country is bound to follow the beaten path of seeking hegemony and pose a so-called threat to other countries. Rabindrana Tagore said in the Nobel Prize acceptance speech, I quote, man is not to fight with other human races, other human individuals. But his work is to bring about reconciliation and peace and to restore the bonds of friendship and love. So in this era, re the colonization of a country, it can be achieved through international cooperation on an equal and mutual beneficial basis. As long as countries treat each other as equals and with mutual understanding and mutual accommodation, there is no problem that cannot be solved through dialogues and negotiations. China is confident of working with other countries around the world to blaze a new trail of peaceful development and win-win cooperation. Taking the path of peaceful development does not mean that we have to give up our rights and interests. 
We will further safeguard China's sovereignty, security, and development interests. Over the past decades, China has developed itself by fostering a peaceful international environment. And in the future, China will not only stay committed to the path of peaceful development, but also sincerely hopes that all the countries in the world will follow the path of peaceful development and jointly safeguard peace and prosperity in this only home of humankind. No matter to which stage of development we reach, we will never seek hegemony, expansion, or sphere of influence. Dear teachers and students, Mr. Tagore's original aspiration was to build a bridge between China, between India, and other civilizations. For more than 80 years, the Visma Bharati University has always been open and inclusive in accepting and studying other civilizations. And at the same time, showcasing and spreading the extensive and profound Indian civilization to the world. In particular, the Chinese college, or you call Chini Baba, which was founded in 1937 by Mr. Tagore and the Chinese scholars, Mr. Tan Yun Shan, has become an academic heaven for India to have Chinese studies. And you are training a large number of talents to understand China. Many of Chinese leading scholars and artists, such as Ji Xianling and Xu Bei Hong, also came here to study and interchange. So let me talk about the China-India relations as the second topic. When we are talking about our relations, we are talking about thousands of years of interactions and exchanges. We are the two, maybe, old civilizations in the world, which has a long history of thousands of years. And uh, when I met with our students in uh, China Bawan this morning, I said that about more than 2,000 years ago, we can find in India the sticks of bamboo and also the cloth from Sichuan province of China. So that shows how far away that we can go when we discuss about our cultural <coughs> trade exchanges. And of course, everyone knows about Xuanzang and Faxian and they traveled to India 1,300 years ago and they wrote down what they, they have seen and they have learned and also they introduced Buddhism to China. And from India, you have Bodhidharma, you have other great monks and travelers going to China. So when I attended the Chennai informal summit this October in uh, Mahabharipura. And uh, we also uh, saw the evidence of China in their cultural exchange. Even in Chinese Fujian province, we can find those statues of Hindu uh, religion that it is still standing there in the Chenzhou city. So through this uh, informal summit, the two leaders, President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Narendra Modi, agreed that uh, Fujian and Tamil Nadu, and also Quanzhou and Chennai, should become sister provinces and cities, so that they can enhance the cooperation nowadays to carry on this tradition of cultural exchange. And I may say that uh, nowadays China and India are 
are sharing a good and sound relations with each other due to the guidance of our leaders. The two leaders have met four times last year in, in the year 2019 in different bilateral or multilateral occasions. And this year marks the 70th anniversary of China-India diplomatic relations. And this is also the year of people to people exchange and cultural exchange year for China and India. So we are going to organize 70 events and activities to celebrate this special year. China and India are the biggest developing countries in the world. We are the two only countries in the world which have a population of more than one billion. And you can see that in this world, one third of the population is either a Chinese or an Indian. And both of us are the emerging economies. We are growing pretty fast. So we are not only old civilizations, but we are also youngsters. We are growing. So if China and India are coming together, it means the future of the world. And China and India should treat each other and regard each other as great opportunities to the future. And also, we must come together for mutual beneficial cooperation and also for exchange of culture and civilizations. As President Xi puts it like this, that uh, when dragon and the elephant is dancing together, it means a blessing to the world. And when Prime Minister Modi put this, he said that when China and India are coming together, one plus one doesn't mean two, but mean eleven. So everybody should know that when China comes and India comes together, when we are making the same voice, the whole world must listen to us. Well, I think these are the messages I would like to uh, convey to you. Of course, as two major countries, maybe we have differences. But it's up to the political dialogue and consultation that we need to seek a solution. And I fully believe that as two great civilizations of Asia, we do have the wisdom to solve all these differences and not let these differences to become disputes. And finally, I may say that uh, uh, now China is growing and changing and uh, it is a country full of uh, vigor and vitality. So I wish all of you to come to China and seeing is believing. I hope you can see by yourself and judge by yourself whether China is a country of the past or a future. And I, 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 I strongly believe that you will have the right answer to that question. With these words, I thank you very much for your patience. And I also wish all of you a very happy life and also a very bright future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sun. I'll just take up the last sentence which he uttered. 
And I think I'm very happy that it's an invitation from him to all of us to visit China to see whether it is a country of the past or the future. So it's an invitation from you to all of us. That's great. Let's cheer him up on that. Shah Shah. So we'll have an invitation soon, right? Okay. Your CT also nodded, so we'll have invitation. The second thing, you know, uh, I must um, give a credit to myself. Uh, before I joined, you know, Mr. Sun is also for your information. The chi Chinese officials, China studies, were confined to China Bhavan. And when I joined, I told the China Bhavan director, OBJ, that Chinese studies, Chinese politics, Chinese history, should not be confined to you only. It should belong to the university, Vishwabharata. And I think you remember when your first visit, I snatched him from China Bhavan and took him to the Department of Economics, Apurba is here to confirm. So I think Mr. Soon, it was my credit that now you are part of the Vishwabharata Parivar, the family. Before it was, you are part of China Bhavan, a very microscopic minority you know, in the university. But yes, I mean, Obiji did a wonderful job to continue the tradition, continue the kind of legacy which uh, Tagore started in, in his, through his visit in 1924. Now, you know, if I listen to him carefully, I am really stuck by three important points. And since he is willing to take up questions, we can focus on those points. The first of all, Philosophically, I think we had the same roots. I mean, if you recollect the discussion which he had, the, the talk which he delivered, you'll find that he referred to some of the ideas which both China and India appreciate. So philosophically, our roots are similar. Second thing, in contemporary world, we have more or less a similar kind of difficulties and we want development. So development is the kind of, you know, the signposting theme which brings us together. So I think we can have questions on development, what sort of path China has pursued and what sort of path we have pursued. So the second aspect of his talk can be described as an aspect which focuses primarily on the development. And the third part, which I think I like most, and which started with, you know, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai, and the five principles of peaceful coexistence, basically, you know, despite being diverse, despite being Bengali, Assamese, Oriya, Tamil, Telugu, we are all Indian. Means what? Basically, compassion. Despite being diverse, we are compassionate, to each other. I mean, I think this is a very important message which I would like to give at this point of time. I mean, there is a miscommunication, misunderstanding that we are trying to blur the diversity, which is not the case. I think Mr. Soon's talk reinforced that point that despite being diverse, just like China, China is not one, it's highly diverse, ethnically, in terms of language, in terms of religion, yet it's a one country. So I think despite being diverse, we continue to remain one simply because we have compassion for each other. So I think these are three important areas on which we can have questions. But my request to you, since his time is very short, that please ask questions, no counter paper. If you have questions, please have very, very precise questions. And if you have comments, very precise comments, because it is a rare opportunity but as I said, he promised to come back in near future. He, he didn't mention the time, he said near future. So we assume this is the beginning of 2020. By this year, we'll have him back. And Madam is nodding, so I think I'm giving the responsibility to her to make sure he comes back. Mm -hmm. All right, so question answer. Please raise your hand. I expect my students to raise hands first and then the teachers and my friends.
তোমরা বলো ছাত্ররা বাংলায় বলো আমি কিন্তু ট্রান্সলেট করে দেব যদি বাংলায় কোনো প্রশ্ন থাকে কি তোমরা ভেবে বলবে কে তোমরা ভেবে বলবে তাহলে ঠিক আছে আমাদের সহকর্মীদের কে যদি প্রশ্ন তোলেন সহকর্মীরা কে কে সবিন বলো বলো একটু জোরে sir tell us jo you can make part of sign doing your relationship what is your view yoga yoga e yoga part of your you know interaction between india and china will you take one question yeah time? of course uh, yoga is uh, very uh, stay popular uh, in china uh, even my wife she practice a lot of yoga in the daily life and uh, i think uh, there are so many things that we can learn from each other and uh, in chinese in china you, you can learn tai chi or the martial arts but uh, both of, uh, of us we can uh, uh, share these uh, experiences i still remember when uh, prime minister narendra modi when he visited china in 2015 uh, we had a big gathering in the temple of heaven in beijing and there are hundreds of chinese uh, practicing tai chi and hundreds of indians practicing yoga so it's such a phenomenon i mean in the world that shows these two civilizations are coming together and when we are learning from each other it's a great benefit to both of us thank you very much what should we learn in What should we learn in politics from China? Uh, I think it's uh, mutual learning first. Uh, secondly, is that uh, well, I would I would just share with you. Uh, few secrets of China's development. I mean, in 40 years, uh, China coming from a, a poor country, which can hardly, you know, make people uh, to be uh, uh, feeded, or I would say, from starvation, to the second largest economy in the world. Uh, of course, first, you need a very strong leadership. Uh, the central government of China and of course the CPC is the leading uh, power for China and uh, it gives us the guidance to move in the right direction and also united the one, nearly 1.4 billion people together. Uh, secondly is that we always focus or concentrate on economic development no matter what happens. We will always focus ourselves on economy. <coughs> and that makes things different. And thirdly, is of course, uh, lots of hard work. Let me say, if you go to China, you can see people, ordinary people, working day and night. And they believe that hard working is a kind of happiness. So these are some of the secrets I could share with you. And uh, I may say that uh, every country has its right to choose its path of development. And due to the different conditions or circumstances, different countries choose different paths, but we should respect each other's political system and their path of development. 
only in this kind of soul that you can grow rice, not wheat. But in other parts of the soul, you can only grow wheat, not rice. So if the soul is suitable for rice, let it grow rice. If it's suitable for wheat, go for wheat. And there's a Chinese saying that if you're wearing a pair of shoes, it's only yourself can tell whether it is comfortable. <laughs> so the Chinese people feel and they strongly believe that the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics is the suitable path for the Chinese. So that's my answer to you. Thank you. You know, the reply, if I am allowed to add to his statement, you know, uh, after my visit to China, when I came back, I came back with two statements. And I found out the secret of Chinese development, which we lack miserably. We means, you know, I'm not talking about the country as a whole, I'm talking about my family, Vishwabharata. The first thing which is very striking once you reach China and once you come back, that gets reinforced, is the idea of ownership. You know, I think I didn't find any of the Chinese people in China who do not consider his or her country as his or her own. So the idea of ownership, this country belongs to me, this is mine. That's one, the ownership, the idea of ownership. And the second thing is, which Mr. Sun has already noted, the idea of hard working. You know, there is no substitute for hard working. And unfortunately, in Vishwabharati, I mean, please forgive me for letting the cat out of the bag. We are not hard working at all. So I think if we want to learn the technique of Chinese politics, which leads to development, I think we have to imbibe these two notions, the idea of ownership and the idea of hard working. Only then, only then we can be good brother of China. Thank you. Yes. In case of new China, we have found a soft land of Bhagavan Buddha, Buddha, land of Buddha. And in case of new China, we have found a soft policy towards Buddhism, which is has some association with your one belt, one road, OBR policy. And India is the abode of Buddha. Then how Buddhism can contribute to calm us more closer? What is your policy, future policy in this aspect? Centering Buddhism and India. Well, thank you for mentioning about uh, Buddhism and also about uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Well, um, this is there are some linkage with between these two things uh, because the the initial idea of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is coming from the old Silk Road. Uh, if we look at the map, we can find there's a, a Silk Road on the route or on the uh, Asia-Europe continent. And there's another route which links China with Africa via sea route or maritime Silk Road. So the idea is that we must revitalize these two ancient routes and uh, we also have a kind of spirit of Silk Road, which is uh, mutual learning, mutual respect, and also win-win cooperation. That along this Silk Road, all the countries, all the civilizations benefited from interaction, from trade, from mutual learning. So that is the idea that uh, this uh, Belt and Road Initiative come from. And it created a platform for the countries to come together 
and doing the projects together. And then they will share the benefits with each other. So it becomes a win-win cooperation. And of course, with the cooperation of the Belt and Road Initiative, cultural or even religious exchange could become part of its cooperation. And uh, last year, China hosted the second uh, Belt and Road uh, Summit in Beijing. And we have several workshops and seminars discussing about the uh, uh, cultural exchange and people-to-people -people contact. So I believe that uh, with the people coming together, we can have even better understanding of each other. And then it will help us to coexist or living in harmony along the belt and the road and along the Silk Road. Thank you very much. One more question. So my question is that, uh, like, uh, we, uh, our department, the students of our department, we are especially learning about in uh, China's culture and Chinese history, and we are very much interested about the language and the history and culture. So I want to know that what about the students of China? Like, are they uh, that much interested in our culture and our history? And are they even provided with any uh, material or any studies regarding India's history and culture? That's a good question. Well, um, I think uh, the Chinese people are also very interested in Indian culture. Because when we are talking about uh, the uh, yoga, or when we are talking about a tea, you know, some tea, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a fashion of young Chinese uh, people in, the, uh, in nowadays. And my wife reminded me about Bollywood. Definitely it is a fashion. Uh, if you ask me about the Bollywood movies I have watched, I can name a few of them. Uh, yes, yes, and uh, Dangal, Dangal, uh, Dangal, the uh, Hindi medium, you know the movie Hindi medium? Hindi medium, uh, it's, a, it's a movie that reflects that we are facing the same uh, kind of challenge of education, and how can we share the same opportunities with ordinary people, and uh, that also uh, gives us a lot of you know, inspiration on that. And if we're talking about history, I watched a movie called Bahobali. <laughs> and that is a fascinating movie. So, uh, of course, we are talking about lots of things in common. And uh, via international, via now modern technologies like internet or WeChat or, you know, mobile, we can know more about each other. And my duty is, of course, not only encourage Indian people to know about China, but also encourage more Chinese people to know about India. Thank you very much. Compare the demographic dividend of India and China. India has higher percentage of uh, younger people as compared to China, and whose population is aging. So, since I'm learning Chinese, I wanted to ask that: Do you think in the new, uh, near future, young Indians can expect job opportunities in China? Yeah, of course <laughs> you can. If you can speak excellent Chinese language, you can definitely have an opportunity in China. And uh, I know that uh, there are so many, uh, you know, Indians now studying in China. Uh, there are about uh, 20,000 Indian students, overseas students, now studying in China, which is much more than Chinese students here in India. And many of them are now studying medical treatment. And Chinese traditional medicine, of course, is very, very useful and helpful for Indian people's health. 
But I think that, uh, as I said, we all belong to the future. So the young people reflect the future of our friendship and relations. <coughs> then if you can learn the Chinese, then you can go to China and find out the job and even can contribute as a you know, uh, folk uh, envoy between China and India as, as ambassadors. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. You know, there is a saying in English that all good things come to an end. Uh, I know there are many questions, but because of paucity of time, we cannot hold him back. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, the ambassador, Mr. Soon. I thank Madam Soon. I thank our friend and brother, C.G. Chavi and his wife. And finally, I thank all of you because your presence made this lecture a grand success. And we have been holding this lecture quite regularly. And without your cooperation, this lecture would not have taken off. So personally, on my behalf, on behalf of Vishwavart administration, I thank you very much. And I thank Dimai for having organized this meeting so quickly. And I thank all of you, I mean, the names I may not be able to mention, but those who work behind the scene, I thank all of them. And please be ready to be around when we have got this kind of, kind of gathering, because it's a rare opportunity. And finally, as I said, the ambassador is so, so kind that he really agreed to address all of us. And we have got very good, talk from him. And I end up uh, by saying that he assured to come back. So I think this is not the last visit. This is probably one of so many visits in future. So I expect the ambassador to come back to Vishwabharati. And also on your behalf, I think we have reasons to be very elated because he wants us to go to China to find out that this country is not the country of the past, it's the country of the future. So we have got an invitation from him. And so I think with that kind of positive note, let us thank him profusely by saying Shadu Shadu by all of us. Shadu Shadu Shadu. Do I have the privilege to be a member of Visva Bharati? Yes. Yes. We, we accept. We accept. Shadu Shadu. Shadu. Yeah, I mean, I really can't see us.